Welcome to the stunning Victorian kitchen garden here in the centre of the Phoenix Park. What a day to be here. I've got two really interesting guests to have a chat with today, two of my favourite Bloom people. Paul Marr, recently retired curator from the National Botanic Gardens in Glasnevin, who's also been a judge with us at Bloom every year since year one, 13 years, and he really knows his onions. I've also got Fino Nulon, 16 gardens at Bloom over 13 years. Some years he had two better known as the holistic gardener. Fien has great pearls of wisdom to share with us around the physical and health benefits of gardening. So let's go meet the guys. Guys, the Sanara, look, look, look at the height. It's got to be one of the most dramatic architectural type plants, and it's not even finished doing its thing yet. No. But, but what is it? Is it edible, ornamental? Where do you start with it? Well, we're in the Victorian Wall Garden, which was, you know, designed to, to, to feed some of the people who lived in the park in that particular era. And that's what this is a relic of. It's, it's a relic of an old, traditional heirloom Victorian edible plant. Now there's another variety called cardoom, which is where the, the leaf and the stem was edible. But this variety, it's the flower. Yeah. It's the globe artichoke. And while this one is quite small, it'll mature into a, a tennis ball size. And the choke is actually cooked as a, as a steamed vegetable or a baked vegetable. And it's quite tasty. It's quite popular in Italian cuisine. Um, but one of its really interesting facts is what it actually does to the body. And it's interesting because it, it, it lowers cholesterol, it, it hires the good cholesterol, it lowers the bad one. Um, it can lower blood sugar response so it can reduce insulin spikes for people who are diabetic post meal consumption. And it's a brilliant one to stimulate the liver and the gallbladder to detox the system. So this is one of these kind of I guess Victorian superfoods that they use to improve the digestive system, but also to detox their bodies after a kind of a, a stodgy winter diet, you know? And it's, it's coming into time now, just as we're hitting summer, when everybody needs their kind of, their energy levels picked back up again. So much more than a pretty plant, Paul. Yeah, and, and I feel so much better standing alongside it here after hearing all of that, Fian. I suppose from my point of view, um, when, when I've used Sainara in, in, in design work, it's always for that architectural strike that something like this gives. It's bright, it's reflecting the light extremely well, um, and it dominates. Uh, it holds the stage, and you can work off a grey colour quite nicely with pretty much any other colour. Um, that you want um, and it's just there with you for the summer and of course it goes back to the ground in the winter and it starts all over again and, and, and does it. It will actually get taller and, and these are super super plants um, and there's possibly three of them here but it, it, it's just so impressive that I'm always attracted to it. I mean I love architectural yeah. stuff anyway I think you know it, uh, it it varies the texture it varies the height as, as a real winner sorry Paul as a perennial is is it long-lived how many years would something like this last um, it, it is it is long-lasting uh, I mean I've, I, I know I know uh, plants that are there for 10 15 years I mean they, they will eventually wear themselves, like all herbaceous perennials, will wear themselves out and, you know, try to move on out and, and, and dominate the, the land that they're planted in. But mm. that's the gardener's job, is the, to, to come in and actually deal with that and put them back uh, in, into place and get the best out of them again. So, I mean, gardening is just about control. That's the main message um, and just controlling it the way that nature intended or the way you want it. So a great plant for every garden? A great plant for every garden. I mean, if you, if you have an allotment, this is a plant where you're growing a gourmet vegetable. And if you just have a small limited space in your garden, and again, this is tying back in with that, something that's multifunctional, yeah. multi-purpose plant, mm. you have the whole architecture of it, stunning statement plant, mm. and you can nip out and get your edible medicinal yeah. bounty from it. Fantastic, one to have.
Paul, we're looking at this fantastic specimen of a phoenix canariensis, but you don't see them in many gardens, do you? No, you don't, Gary. Uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's got that tropical effect. And as you said, it's the Canary Island palm. Now, this particular palm is growing outdoors in the wall garden here in the Phoenix Park, and it's sheltered, which just lets us know that it can survive in a sheltered Dublin garden mm. um, and it's growing well um, it you know it doesn't like too much frost but it will take some frost um, you don't see them all that often uh, you will see them sold as house plants mm. and you can grow them in your home uh, you can grow them in your home and put them out for the summer or as I have done in the past I've grown them very very well uh, up until we got those dreadful summers of 09 into 10 or mm. 10 into 11, uh, wh which annihilated everything. But uh, again, on that architectural note that I love, uh, I think it's it's a great one. Yeah, fantastic plant. It's got a lot more going on for it as well, but Fiend, hasn't it? Yeah, for me, it's the it's the 40 shades of green that's permeating through. You know how the sun catches it from behind and you see all these different shades. And, and green is really interesting because it's, it's one of the early colours that when we became hominoids and, and started walking upright and hunting and gathering and foraging for our foods, to be able to recognise green in the distance meant there was a water source or there was a food source mm. or there was a shelter source. So the eye is more receptive to green and green it turns out lowers the systolic blood pressure because once you see that green in the distance you know the oasis is there that's the oh, it's okay I'm gonna yeah. get through another day type yeah. thing so I would use that as a, as a horticultural therapist I would use green a lot as one of those sustaining colors as the main foil in the garden mm. to be able to relax and bring on that sense of well-being that, that that green just achieves and again like that where Paul is saying as a houseplant everything doesn't have to be about having a garden yeah even some people don't have a balcony yeah. You can bring lots of plants inside. There's herbs you can grow in the windowsill. There's, there's food that you can grow inside, chilies, tomatoes. But the, the, the green aspect of it, that's, yeah. that's what really makes a room a, a relaxing space. Mm. I've often heard you talk about how the human eye can identify more shades of green than any other colour. And as you said, there's very good reason for that, because yeah. that's sanctuary. That's where we get away from the danger. But for the times that we live in now, Fiend, mm. it's never been more important, has it, to be aware of green and how you can get into that green green space. And, hey, and, and even like that, where we're coming out of lockdown or we're easing lockdown, for a lot of people there's more panic in that than yeah. there was in staying in and being safe. And look at how many people have flocked, where have they flocked to? They flocked to the beauty sites. It's not just about the fresh air, mm. it's, the, it's the natural reserve of well-being that you feel when you participate with nature. And the green does that. I mean, even of all you have is a lawn at home standing barefoot on the lawn, yeah. ground you yeah. into the earth. It, it pulls the polarity out of your body through and that boosts your immune system. So being around green, participating with green, that's one of the best health measures we can take. And I think that's why most gardeners are kind of happy and feel healthy and feel content. It's because mm -hmm. we're yeah. getting their daily dose of, yeah. green. of nature medicine, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. I Go on, Paul. It's, it's not just about colour, sure, it's not. It's green. It's that's green. the point. I, yeah. I, I think it's that's, and, and that is very true. Uh, in, in my years working in uh, the National Botanic Gardens as the curator, and th there were stressful days. There were there was times yeah. when it wasn't going right, this wasn't happening or whatever. And I would just maybe close the book and go for a walk in the greenery of the garden. And as you say, you kind of mm. come back and it's okay. Yeah. And it's vitally important, I think, now we're walking more, to get young people out into the woods and the forests to appreciate that green environment. Because, mm. you know, from when they're that size, that's when they're learning. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we see what young people have done in relation to climate change and that drive that they had. And, you know, if we can get them, again, you know, focusing even more on planting trees. I mean, we do not have enough trees in Ireland. Yeah. And we're starting to hear more of these kind of terminology like uh, forest bathing. Yeah. Or we're hearing about doctors in New Zealand prescribing gardening mm. instead of medication. Mm. Do you think that's the way we're going to go? Do you think that's the lesson that we're learning that, from this about getting out and engaging with nature? Yeah, because it's not just human health. There's a human health dividend that comes from that, but it's the planetary health. 
if we're planting more trees, if we're respecting the trees more, the trees are the, you know, mm. the lungs of the world. It is about how it filters the toxins from the air and gives us the oxygen. But even like that, like I'm saying, we're a lawn. One average sized lawn supplies enough oxygen to keep two human beings alive for the day. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's how we participate with nature. Yeah. Whether we're fully fledged gardeners and we want a big, beautiful garden, or whether we just want the calm and tranquil nature space that we can retreat yeah. to. I, I, I think we're appreciating that more. Yeah. And I think as people walk through the park, they see more. They hear more birds, yeah. there's less mm. traffic, there's less, you know, there's less going on in the world, they have time. Mm. And gosh, we should learn the lesson and continue uh, in this vein of appreciating everything that, it, that there is about nature. Yeah. Fien, I'm, I'm looking at the, the bees buzzing around this Napita, but uh, if, you're a, if you're a cat, it's a hard drug, isn't it? Seriously. It's a hard, yeah, it's a hard drug. It's it's um, Napita lactone is the principle that's contained within. It's an aromatic compound that's contained within the foliage and the flowers. And on the cat system or two cats, it's quite similar to LSD. So the cats get a bit of a nostatic um, participation with the plant, which is why if you have this at home, either yours or the neighbor's cat is probably rolling around it all day. Um, but for humans it's interesting because for humans that same principle has an impact on air GABA receptors in the brain and lowers anxiety. So this was traditionally used in herbal teas um, to calm panic attacks and severe anxiety. But for me, even before you get to making it into a cup of tea, just that colour alone, this, this colour here, this, this fine pale blue, that's quite similar to the type of sky we're under today. And that type of sky, when we look at it, pings a receptor at the back of our eye that causes a serotonin release. So this is the, the benefits of being out in your garden, is yeah. getting the, the blue waves that creates the happy hormone. But if it's an overcast day, that blue is still there. So yeah. this is one of these plants to have in your garden that you can get some colour therapy from. So it, it's almost human nip as well as cat It's human nip, nip too, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Paul, I'm familiar with um, the Peter Katari, but I've, I've forgotten all the other species. It's a lot more interesting, isn't it? It is a lot more interesting. And uh, this is Napita Six Hills Giant. And it's a staple of um, herbaceous borders or perennial borders. Um, it's got a lovely lax habit. It's always to the front. And uh, even though it's lying on the lovely box edge there, it equally could float out on that gravel as well. Um, it's got scent and as we can see here uh, this morning um, there's bees everywhere on it. It's humming um, which is great to see. The other interesting thing about Ernapita here is that you can extend the season by doing a, a chop. In other words when these flowers start to fade somewhat go right back down to just where they are and shear it off and you get another flush of growth coming again. So more value for your plant and a great one to have. Brilliant. Fiend, you're always going about how we can take these plants into the kitchen and infuse them and make tea, but, but is, is it easy or is it a complicated process? No, this is really easy. Again, you just strip off some of the leaves, put them in boiling water as you would a normal herbal tea, let it sit for maybe one minute to three minutes and there you have a refreshing beverage that's also calming and soothing on the nerves. Just don't give a drink of it to the cat. <laughs> Paul, I'm glad we stopped to look at the lavender. Um, very common plant and we, and we all love it. But it's something that we take for granted, isn't it? We think we're gonna have this around for years to come. And it's a question mark. Well, there is a question mark, Gary, certainly, yes. And it has been around for almost ever, for all, uh, all of our gardening lives. Um, something that we love, something that my grandmother would have spoken about. Um, and um, it's got gorgeous scent. It's a very tidy, neat plant. Um, but the, the, I suppose the worry that I have, and we all should have, is that um, you know, there is a, a, a threat of disease um, out there in, in the wide world that um, uh, can affect the likes of lavender. Um, and it's that xylella um, uh, that we've, we've got to try as best we can keep out of the country. Um, and what we need to do is, um, you know, just be sure of the stock that we're buying. Uh, be sure that we're, 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 
we're buying plants that are uh, produced at home, and we source them at home, um, because we know they're here. Um, Xylella is uh, particularly difficult because there's several different subspecies of it, um, and one in particular will attack and annihilate lavender, rosemary, cistus, all those lovely garden plants um, that we have. Um, so um, we're, we're mer very mindful. We don't have it in Ireland, but it is sort of coming across Europe at us. Um, it's affected olive plantations in Italy, um, and you know, they're gone. Uh, and we mustn't let that happen. Mm. And the really interesting thing is that uh, these things come about because we travel. And the curious thing is that awful and all as COVID-19 is, we're not traveling anymore. Yeah. So, you know, it lessens. It is, I suppose, one of the positives, if you like, of, if, we can, if there is a positive yeah. of COVID-19. Yeah. Um, so we must be very, very careful about not bringing plant material back from our travels. Yeah. The notion that, you know, you pick a sprig somewhere in northern Italy because it looks better, it smells better, and definitely better than the one at home. Mm. Don't do that. Yeah. Because you could put all other lavenders in jeopardy. Yeah. And with this year being the International Year of Plant Health, I think it's really important to get that message it out is. there. It Human is. health and plant health. Yeah, You've got to think is. about everything. Yeah. And the two, yeah, the two go hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Fina, I know you, you, you've spoken about lavender. I think you've been researching it all your life. It's a hugely important plant, isn't it? Hugely important plant. And it's, it's kind of one of the first plants that got me interested in the medicinal botany side of stuff because, you know, Back when I was looking at, at kind of plant nomenclature and, and you're looking at, you know, where did, what the name means about the plant and how it may give you clues to where you might grow it or to what it might look like when it grows. With, with, with lavender and lavandula was that thing that it comes from the Latin lavare, which is to wash, mm. and that it, it was utilised initially as a fragrant wash. Um, for skin complaints, but also to treat uh, postpartum depression. So that was my first kind of insight into the fact that what we grow in our garden could have a medicinal value. And, and for me, lavender is, you know, it's, it's one of those plants that it's your starter kit on the road to developing a herbal mm. garden. Now, whether you want to go fully fledged in and start developing plants that can be used as botanicals and cosmeceuticals for external and internal, you know, just the fragrance benefit of it, the aromatherapeutic value of lavender. It's, it's an adaptogenic plant. And by adaptogenic, I mean, it helps us cope with physical, environmental, and um, emotional uh, stresses and strains. Mm. So it's one of those plants that when you get the, the lovely inhale, that, yeah. that deep, there's a medicinal scent to it and a floral scent to it that it aerates the lungs and improves oxygenation. But all this phytochemistry contained within the aromatherapeutic oils contained within it has such a tremendous health benefit that it's the one, if all you had was a balcony, yeah. it's the one it's the I'd one. say, get that. You know, whatever about growing your own food and stuff, this is, this is your introduction. And, and for, for kids or for your grandkids, this is one of those plants that will bring in pollinators as well so there's, yeah. there's there's a whole story and a whole connection into the, the, the this is the the micro in the macro of a garden you know this is it's my favorite plant and it, it'd just be dreadful if it was one of those plants that we were going to lose yeah. or was going to suffer you know all that just 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 from one plant just from one plant yeah. Is, yeah is is there a particular i see i see a lot more of the french lavender lavender yeah. uh, stoches yeah does it matter which one you have you go for no, I mean, stuff like this, like the angustifolia and things like that, they, they, we're, we're, we're traditionally more used to that, the kind of the narrower leaf variety, yeah. and, it, and it can be a little bit more hardier within the, the yeah. Irish climate than the kind of the French ones. Thank you for joining us for that conversation with Fien and Paul. I could listen to those guys all day, pearls of wisdom inspiration and information all in one conversation. On behalf of all of us in Board Beer, I want to thank the OPW for providing us with this beautifully maintained space. What a fantastic setting for the conversation. To you at home, I really want to say a word of thanks for helping us keep the spirit of Bloom alive. We will be back next year, I promise you that. Until then, stay safe and stay gardening.